gentlemen, the American writer, novelist uh, in the 19th century, Henry David Thoreau, it's a very interesting line. He says this, The mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. The mass of men live lives of quiet desperation. And over the last you know, what, four decades or something, I've talked to a lot of men. And you know what? If you, just, if you can talk somewhere quietly, if you just scratch a little bit, that desperation is there. It's there. And there might be lots of different reasons. One, I guess one reason is you get to a certain age and your dreams begin to die. I don't just mean that you kind of realise you're not going to play cricket for Australia. That happened to me fairly early. Huh? But, but your dreams, all those things that you hoped would happen, that you looked forward to, when you realise they're, they're not going to happen. Uh, there's a book by... Robert Bly called Iron John about blokes and their dreams. It's a strange kind of book, but he's got an interesting little uh, snippet in it. Um, it's written uh, for an American audience, but you can translate. He says this, A young man in high school dreams that he will be a race driver, a mountain climber. He'll marry Miss America. He'll be a millionaire by age 30. He'll win a Nobel Prize in physics by 35. He'll be an architect and build the tallest building ever. He'll get out of this hick town and live in Paris. He'll have fabulous friends. And by 35, all these dreams are ashes. There'll be those things that you'd wish to happen and you realise they never will and you kind of feel embarrassed about telling people and so you carry that around. As you get older, you your options of what you can do narrow. I mean, there was a time when I thought about going into the army. The only army I could join now would be the Salvation Army. I don't know if they'd have me. It just happens. So there's that. Your dreams begin to die. Or maybe you carry around heartache. And, and I don't know anybody that's kind of got to middle age without real heartache. And it might be a marriage that hasn't worked, it might be worry about your kids, it might be worry about your health or worse still, the health of someone you love or it might be a career that crashed or a business that didn't work or, or whatever. I'll tell you a really common one for men and that's Groundhog Day. I don't know if you've seen the movie, it's getting a bit old now with uh, Bill Murray and Andy McDowell. It's interesting. Bill Murray plays a part of this uh, journalist who's stuck in this little hick town and he ends up having to relive the same day again and again and again. <clears throat> you get to a certain age and that's, that's what it feels like. The same thing again and again and again. Or you live with stress, the pressure of just of expectations or of holding your job or paying a mortgage or getting it all done and it... Now, I managed to do something that I think is logically impossible. Maybe you do too. I managed to be bored and stressed at the same time. I, I don't think that's logic. You, you can't fit that together logically, but it happens. Bored and stressed. So what's the answer? Well, okay, what's the answer to, you know, you, you, your dreams are dying, there's heartache, um, your options narrow, there's, uh, there's, you live with boredom. Aren't you glad you came along, right? Okay. So you, you live with that. What's the, well, the obvious answer is become a Christian. That'll fix it all. There's a book that came out a while ago called Wild at Heart by John Eldridge. It's actually about 20 years old now. I've got it on my shelf, underlined. And John Eldridge, um, uh, he says, every man needs a beauty to, not a beauty to fight, wait a minute. Every man needs a battle to fight a beauty to rescue, an adventure to live. So he's writing about the Christian life as a great adventure. Here's some quotes from it. He says this, Life is not a problem to be solved, it's an adventure to be lived. Or, don't ask yourself what the world needs, ask yourself what makes you come alive and go and do that. Because that's what the world, so, because what the world needs is people who have come alive. Or, the spiritual life cannot be suburban, said Howard Macy. It must always be frontier, and we who live in it must accept and even rejoice that it remains untamed. So is a Christian life an adventure? Look, I've been, I've been following Jesus 42 years, and I'm not looking for a refund. 
Best thing that's ever happened to me. An adventure, well, you'll see what God will do in your life and etc. Yep. But I think it's an adventure in the way that he's talking about. Because I'll tell you what happens. You'll get up one morning and it's day number 8,736 that you've got to go to work. And if you live where I live, I used to work in the city four days a week till a couple of years ago. And in winter time, you're on a train and people are standing there and it's cold and, and it's early and people have the 1,000-metre stare, right? And they're all sitting there thinking, please kill me. I'm commuting 8,700. Or you're sitting in traffic and these last couple of days I've discovered you actually have traffic in Perth. You've got to look for it, <laughs> but it's there. And it's a cold winter's morning and it's number 8,736. And you're thinking, woohoo! This is an adventure following Jesus. That's not what you're thinking. There's a big chance you're thinking, it's Groundhog Day. Again and again and again. How do you make sense of that? In the New Testament, there's a, a, a letter written by the Apostle Paul to people who'd become followers of Jesus in a little town called Colossae, which would be in modern-day Turkey. And Paul hadn't actually met them himself, he'd just heard about them. And so he writes this letter to tell them to keep on going, to fo following Jesus. And he says something, I just want to show you one little phrase in that letter that I think just carries so much understanding about how you see life. Let me show you. Here we go. As he writes them, he says he's going to pray for them. Great thing to do. And so he says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you, we've not stopped praying for you. And so what does he pray for them? He prays, we continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. Okay, he asks that the Spirit of God would make them wise, the way God sees the world, in verse 10, so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way. If you, if you follow Jesus, you, you, you know, you carry his name, you need to live a life that pleases him, yep. What does that look like? Bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Doing the right thing, growing to know God. Then he prays, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. He says, I want the power of God at work in your life, yeah, so that you may have great, hold it there, Andrew, don't go. You may have great what? He says, I'm going to pray. This is like the Apostle Paul praying for them that the power of God would be a work in their life so they'd have great, what would you expect? Do miracles, make you rich or beautiful or live the victory life or famous or it's not what he says. You may have great what? Endurance and patience. And giving thanks joyfully or giving joyful thanks to the Father. Isn't that interesting? If you follow Jesus, he's saying the power of God will be at work in your life to give you what? Endurance and patience. And I found that, wow. When you dig around in the original languages, I can, you, can, you can look around, the word um, patience is used 24 times in the New Testament. And the word for endurance, 31 times. If you want later, I can give you all the different places that it's used, etc. But what's he saying? The power of God at work for the man who follows Jesus will be to give him endurance and patience. You know what? It's so easy to miss that, isn't it? It's not flashy. It's not kind of charismatic in the normal sense of the word. I mean, like there's all this big charisma, etc. Just endurance and patience is what God will give his men who follow Jesus. Okay, so just park that, that idea of endurance and patience. Just park that over here for a moment. I want to ask you another question. What's the difference between boys and men? What's the difference between boys and men? It's not age. It's not whether you shave or not, your face or your head. No? Um, it's not... Have you got a driver's license? It's not how much grog you can drink. It's not how you go with the ladies or any of those things. 
Steve Biddulph, who um, actually I think he's a very good author, wrote the book called Manhood. I heard him on a radio interview and he was asked that, what's, what's the difference between boys and men? He said this, boys care about themselves, men care for other people. Boys care about themselves, men care for other people. As I thought about that, I thought, yeah, I reckon I've met 18-year-old men and I've met 50-year-old boys. I don't know if you're familiar with Jordan Peterson. Uh, he's a Canadian psychologist. Uh, over the last few years, he's kind of become a bit of a world celebrity. Uh, and it's interesting that he, he gives lectures about thinking through life and different philosophies, etc. Um, and his message is reasonably clear. It's kind of, it's generic in a way, but it's young men who've grabbed hold of it. And he's coming back again. Like he had a tour through 120 cities around the world. And uh, in Sydney, you couldn't get a ticket within 30 seconds. It just sold out. Auditoriums full of what? Young men. And his message is basically this. Life is hard. You need to get your act together and look after the people around you. Uh, and you know, young men say, oh, actually that... That sounds kind of right. Eh? Or in his book, um, 12 Rules for Life, the first one, he says this. Yep. It is for this reason that I tell my students, aim to be the person at your father's funeral that everyone in their grief and misery can rely on. There's a worthy and noble ambition. Strength in the face of adversity. That's very different from the wish for a trouble-free life. <clears throat> See, guys, I... I spent a lot of time thinking about this and I've got this little book coming out soon. And by the way, I don't get a dollar for it. I've, I don't get any money for it, so I don't mind giving a little bit of a push. I've worked out, I reckon, the essence of, the essence of healthy masculinity is a willingness to take responsibility. It's to step up and say, I got this. So how do you combine that, that this idea of Healthy masculinity is to step up and take responsibility about looking after other people and taking responsibility for things and what matters. And I'm going to, I'll be there, I'll be reliable, I've got this. How do you combine that with Groundhog Day? It's all about patience and endurance. And I want to ask you, as you think, as a man, whatever stage of life you're in, you've got the opportunity to invest in and make a difference in the lives of the people that you really care about. And you know what? It might only be a small part of the world, but it'll be the part of the world that you really care about. If you're married, wife, if you've got kids, your kids, it may be your parents, if they're still around, your family, friends. If you're not married, it'll be a bunch of people that you do really care about. If you're a follower of Jesus, it'll be the Christian community that you belong to, the church. So how do you make a difference? How, how is it that you make a difference in the lives of those people? How do you really invest in, in something that will really matter? Very rarely is it one spectacular event. It might be, but I mean, they're rare. How do you do it? Well, I wouldn't quote Woody Allen on too many things, but Woody Allen said, the famous quote, 80% of success is just turning up. And he's, he's right. The way you make a difference in life is by endurance and patience and turning up. That's how you do it. As a kid, you know, I had the greatest example of endurance and patience I've ever, ever seen. In fact, one of the best I've ever heard of. And I was too young and too stupid to really appreciate it. But let me tell you the story of my grandfather. Donald John Shaw, there's a picture of him was born in 1891 on the banks of the Clarence River. Now, the Clarence River uh, is in northern New South Wales. It's a big river, runs through Grafton, uh, hits the coast at Yamba. It's a little bit north of Coffs Harbour. But he's born um, 1891. In 1915, at the age of 24, he marched from Grafton to Sydney. That's 600 or so kilometres. Um, with a bunch of blokes called the Australian Boomerang Regiment. 
1915. And they marched that 600 kilometres. They started with 27 men. They arrived with 240. And why did they do that? They did that so they could enlist in the First World War. He enlisted as a volunteer. He went to France. He fought in the trenches there. He was gassed. Um, uh, he recovered, came home uh, to live in that country town. Um, in 1921, at the age of 30, he became a Christian believer. And he was part of a, um, a little Presbyterian church in this country town. So 1935, he's married. He's got uh, seven kids. That little girl he's holding is my mother, 1935. Um, he worked in a, a kind of a public service job uh, working with farmers, the Pastures Protection Board. So he's sitting in the little Presbyterian church, 1935. He's aged uh, 44 by then. And uh, the minister, J.P. McQueen was the minister's name, stands up. And this is a story I'm told. He announced he was returning to Scotland. I won't attempt the accent, but he's returning to Scotland and... Uh, Mr. Donald Shaw, my grandfather, will be taking the church services until the new minister arrives, which is the first my grandfather had heard of it. The, uh, you know, the hospital pass. So he picked up the ball. Now, my grandfather wasn't tertiary trained. He hadn't been to Bible college. So, so by his personal choice, he didn't feel like he could preach or teach the Bible. So what he would do... And I heard him do this like later as a kid. He would prepare written sermons that were given by the greats of the past, like Charles Spurgeon or uh, George Whitfield or J.C. Ryle, etc. One wonderful preachers from a previous century. And he would read these to, in, the, in the church meetings in a beautiful, deep voice and carefully prepared. Twice on a Sunday, he would do that. Different, different talks each morning, morning or night. When it came to holidays, he would, they would go to Yamba, the mouth of the river, and camp there to have a holiday. But on, uh, on Saturday night, he would catch, or Saturday afternoon, he would catch the bus back to town. Probably took an hour and a half. He would take the two church meetings on the Sunday, and then he'd catch the bus back down to the beach. That's what he did for, um, uh, for holidays. He would also ride his push bike from one side of town to another and carry a push mower and then mow the lawn of the church, etc. Um, now, he did that twice on a Sunday, mowed the lawn, led the singing, did all of those things in his tiny little church. He did that until the next minister arrived, 37 years later. I'm just, uh, 1972. From 1935 to 1972, and I can remember as towards the end of that, I, I turned up that he did it every week. Now, he died in 1983 at the age of 92. Um, did it make a difference? Well, that little Presbyterian church is still going 87 years after he got the job. And three of his great great grandchildren were baptized in that church over the last couple of years how did he make a difference in some ways he's an ordinary man he just kept on turning up to what he really valued and the people he really cared about so gentlemen my question for you tonight is what or who do you really value and are you going to keep turning up? Because it's as you turn up, it's as you invest your life with endurance and patience that you really make a difference. And sure, there'll be Groundhog Day and there'll be boredom and there'll be tiredness, and so, but that, to keep on turning up. Not passive, not resigned, not sulky, not petulant, but deliberate. And you know what? That makes all the difference. And so it's when you decide, I am going to get up and I'm going to go to work 10,000 days. And that's about how many times you've got to do it. And why am I going to do that? I'm going to do that to feed and care for the people I love. If you've got little kids or, or 
primary school age or high school, I'm going to get up on a Saturday morning even though I'm tired and I'm going to take my kids to sport because that's what dads do. If you're a Christian man, I'm going to turn up at church even when I'm tired. And I'm going to walk across the building and I'm going to talk to that new person even though it feels awkward. I'm going to keep turning up. I'm going to keep doing it. And if, if you don't have a family, if you don't have wives and kids or whatever, there'll be a bunch of people that you care about that you can make a difference with. How? By just turning up. As I think back about my, my humble efforts, anything I've ever achieved is by just keeping on turning up. As a dad, am I the sharpest knife in the drawer? No, but I mean, I think for 22 years, I, I took my son... I started off taking him to, to play rugby and then he could drive himself and I turned up and I watched his sport and then my girls play water polo and hockey and you just, you keep turning up. Um, over the years, what, I've given 4,000 Bible talks? Are any of them world shattering? No, but you keep doing it, it does, it makes a difference. Or I was involved in Katoomba, uh, Katoomba Christian Convention for uh, Katoomba Christian Convention is um, uh, a convention for Christians at Katoomba, okay, if you haven't heard of it. Um, I was involved in that for 30 years. It's a two-hour drive to Katoomba up the, up the mountains. Uh, I think I made 150 trips to Katoomba and the, these conventions. And Was any one of them world-shattering? No, but you just keep on... makes a difference over time. So what I'm going to ask you tonight is, what are you going to keep turning up to? Um, not being domesticated, not being emasculated, choosing to do it. Now, you'll still need to do stuff that's fun. Well, I don't know whether that's hitting a golf ball or going fishing or, or I don't know, whatever it is for you. I've got a mate who's uh, he's crazy, but his thing is running ultra marathons. So he trains for a couple of months, and then he goes out and does his... 100 kilometer or 100 mile races and he that's that's his thing and for me i've got a prenup agreement with kathy and i get to sneak off the bush you know once a year and chase a few pigs around and that that's great and you'll need your things you do that's fun but you know what most of us most of us will live with stress and boredom and groundhog day just, that's life But when you know why you're doing something, when you know why you're turning up and who you're turning up for, it changes everything. As a uh, as a great program in the in the Simpsons about um, uh, Homer and um, Marge, mum and dad, uh, are being asked by Bart and Lisa, their two older kids, how come there's no photographs of Maggie, the baby, uh, in the house. And so Homer and Marge tell the story. When uh, Homer worked at the nuclear power plant and uh, they worked out, well, Homer worked out that uh, with two kids, Bart and Lisa, he could afford to quit the power plant and go and have his dream job at the bowling alley. And he was so happy. Um, he, you know, he'd at the bowling alley all day. He was able to put his head into the bowling ball shiner and uh, get his head really shiny. We got the, yeah, that's it. And uh, kind of identify with this a little bit. Anyway, get his head really shiny. And it was a perfect job. He was so happy uh, that he'd been able to leave the power plant and the cruel Mr. Burns. And then, unexpectedly, Marge gets pregnant. And he worked out that he could not afford to work at the bowling alley with three kids. And so... He has to go back to Mr. Burns at the nuclear power plant and uh, ask for his job back. In fact, Mr. Burns makes him crawl through the pet door uh, in his office, headed up supplicants, the applicants and supplicants, the little, has to crawl through the pet door and ask for his job back. And Mr. Burns gives him his job back at the nuclear power plant, sitting in the chair, but in front of him, he puts on the wall a sign that says, don't forget, you're here forever. And what does Homer do? This is one of the few times he actually really gets it right. 
as he sits and stares, don't forget you're here forever. In the final scene of the, of the program, he's taken pictures of Maggie, his baby, and put them over that sign so that it says, do it for her. And so Homer turns up in his boring job at the nuclear power plant again and again with endurance and patience. Why? Because he's doing it for her. And it changes everything. Robert Louis Stevenson, the Scottish author, wrote this. He said, Everyday courage has few witnesses, but yours is no less noble because no drum beats for you and no crowd shout your name. It may be that no one will even really notice, but you'll know, and you'll make a difference to the parts of the world, the people, that really matter. Now, that applies to everyone, whether you follow Jesus or not. Gentlemen, I, I, if you're not a follower of Jesus, endurance and patience is still the way you make a real difference. Okay. But even more, if you are a follower of Jesus... Endurance and patience has eternal value because that's how you invest in the lives of people. And you'll have friends and mates who aren't followers of Jesus yet and the way that you win the right or the opportunity to speak, the way that you can earn that so they may listen is by living with endurance and patience in the way you treat them and other people. So we need to learn to play the long game, endurance and patience. Dan, I'm done. Thanks, Al. I'll ask Al to stay up on the stage. I'm going to give you guys just two minutes just to think about some of the things that he said. Uh, think about the areas that you need to be turning up taking responsibility, the things that you need to be valuing. valuing. Um, I'm going to give you just two minutes to, to think about those things and submit any more questions that you might have. Uh, they'll be up on the screen, and then I'll get into those questions. So a couple of minutes, and then we'll be with you guys. All right, we're looking good there, guys. Okay, cool. So we do have a couple of questions that have come through. All right, I'll be going to look up. A couple of screens for you to choose from. Okay. We haven't really got enough screens. I no. just think we probably... There is one more there, though. If you oh, good. Right. Okay. But when Excellent. I get home after work, I just want to switch off. I just want my own space to do the things I like. How can I fight this struggle? Sent from anonymous. <coughs> I'm assuming none of you wrote your name yeah. on these, but... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is hard, isn't it? Getting home uh, and the tank is empty. Uh, depend also on the home you go to, you know, if you go home to if you've got, you know, if your wife's been fighting with your teenage son, um, you know, you walk into that and et cetera. It is good if you can, if you can mentally, I'm not saying I always manage this, but if you can mentally think, I can't switch off till I've been home for a while. It's when if you think, if you just walk in and want to collapse, if, if you're married and your wife's had kids and a bad day and et cetera, et cetera, or whatever, if you can think, I'm on duty for half an hour or an hour after I get home, to get home, listen to her, debrief, that kind of thing, and then when things are in order, you can, you can crash a bit. I think that's, it's useful to have that in your head. Yeah. yeah. Good. You got that, I think I don't, know if that's, I don't know if that's the complete answer, <laughs> but it's, it's a help. Yeah, that is really helpful. I know that's helpful for me, seriously. Yep. It sounds like you turn up for the... Sounds like you turn up for the things you want it to do. How do I turn up for the things I hate doing? <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's where it's really important to understand who you're doing it for. Huh? That, that's, that's the point. Uh, uh, and, and, and difficult things. Now, I mentioned, yep, okay, marriage, etc. cetera. Um, 150 trips to Katoomba, the Katoomba Convention. I was committed to it. I didn't always want to go. And so, if I could say, when you're a kid, people tell you to do the stuff you don't want to do. The definition of being a grown man is you choose to do the things you don't want to do. Why? For the good of other people. So, the bit, who wants to get up and go to work 10,000 times? It, you, it's being a grown-up, it's choosing to do things you don't really want to do. 
And uh, there's lots of things that I don't really want to do that I, I do because I know by turning up, that's how you make a difference. Yeah. And it's, I think it's a different too. When you understand and you're really clear on why you're doing it and who you're doing it for, it means you're not grumpy or petulant or snarly or think, no, nope, don't want to do it. It's got to be done. Yeah. Yep. It comes back to those values you were talking about. I, I think so, yeah. All right. Fine. Yep. Any more questions, Fish? Yep, we've got another question. Um, it can be quite lonely and discouraging as we do keep turning up. How do we break away from thinking we have to do this alone and on our own strength? Uh, yeah, yeah. It is interesting as I, as I talk, as I read about the whole men's thing, is how, um, how many men don't have close friends? Um, uh, and, see, friendship, friendship costs, it costs time and it costs forgiveness. You'll never find another bloke who doesn't annoy you. Right? you. You just won't. And if you won't forgive and if you won't cut a bloke some slack and if you won't put up with someone who's annoying, and I've got, I've got friends, I've got probably I've got three or four mates that I've been mates with for 30 years plus. And there's things about them that drive me mad. You know? I don't drive them mad, of course. I'm, you know, I've got no blind spots. Uh, but you, you've got to be able to forgive. And the other thing is friendship costs time. Right? And so you actually have to invest time to keep and make, and make friendship, I think. But it makes a massive difference. And long-term friendships really are the, you know, what keeps your soul going. So, if I could say one 30-year friendship is more valuable than 31-year friendships. Yeah. So you, and the, but you, do, you need to work hard at keeping your long-term friends, but you also have to welcome new people as well. And so for, now, blokes do things side by side. Uh, they don't... W women will sit and talk face-to-face -face and, and chat. And blokes tend to do things side by side. So you... You go and play golf together or you, you go fishing together or whatever it is and you, you talk together as you, as you do things. And that, you know, that's, that's just the way kind of I think men are. But it does, there is an investment of time and forgiveness and patience in maintaining friendships. That's good. Yep. Got time for one more, guys? All right, here we go. Oh. How, how do you deal with uh, unappreciative kids? Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, okay. They're all different, aren't they? They're all different. Here's the irony. You don't want to play favourites and you want to treat all your kids the same and fairly and because they're all different, you've actually got to treat them differently or you've got to act differently with them, okay? Unappreciative kids withdraw services, I guess. Right? <laughs> There's a whole lot of stuff that you do for them that if you stop doing it, uh, they'll, you know, but, but like I say, they're all different. And at least three out of my, one's as, as smart as me and the other three are smarter. So <laughs> anyway, they, you think, oh, that's not an achievement. Anyway, it's a, but uh, yeah, it, it's interesting. It comes a time when you realise my kids are smarter than me. Mm. Right? I mean, generally, don't, it, uh, you know, uh, yeah. So unappreciative kids, you control a lot of what happens in the house and a lot of the services that they receive. I, you, could, you know, here's, here's one thought on parenting. That is, if you can link behaviour to consequences in an age-appropriate way, the more you're able to do that, the more they learn the lessons. All right? So... Um, Uh, the kid who forgets his lunch all the time and mum drives up to the school and gives him lunch is just going to keep doing that. A couple of days of being hungry and he won't forget his lunch. Right? It doesn't always work, but that's the kind of thing that I, that I mean. Yeah. Right? Um, uh, the kid that's uh, disrespectful to his mother might find that mother stops actually doing things for him or whatever. So there's a, 
if you can link behaviour and consequences, um, age appropriate. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm laughing because apparently uh, lecturing my kid for lit, oh, ten, 10 minutes before school the other day because he was not appreciative didn't work. So the lecture route doesn't work. I didn't even write that question, but that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, all right, what about this one? Well, like if he's not appreciative of getting a lift to school, maybe he could walk once or twice. <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm I so mean, glad I you're preaching tomorrow. Well, okay, uh, Al Rochelle, let's keep the kids in for the whole service. No, uh, that, uh, well, I, don't know. I mean, if he's four years old and it's yeah. a long way, maybe not. But anyway, just uh, age appropriate. Yeah. Age appropriate. No, he's, fine. he's six. You'll be all right. Okay. All right, what about when caring for our family means working long hours and not having time left to just turn up? Wow, yeah, that's hard, isn't it? You're, you're balancing, well, it's a, it's, a, it's a balancing act, isn't it? Of um, uh, Sometimes you've just got to work long hours and, not, and you shouldn't feel guilty about that and you've got to do it. Mm. But I guess, too, then it's, it's worth trying to look at the cost of... of if I'm working so long to support my family, that family life's actually going to collapse or my marriage is going to collapse or, or whatever, then that costs too high. I need, to, I need to make those structural changes so I'm around. And the other thing, gentlemen, I'd say, your kids are only little for a little while. If you've got young kids, it feels like... How old are your kids? Uh, six and eight. Six and eight. Right? It feels like they'll be around for... No, no, no. You've got ten years. They're gone. So you, you may need to just change things in family so that you can, you can be around. Don't feel guilty about working long hours for a certain period of time. But, you know, like we, bought, we bought a house in um, uh, 1992 and it was a beautiful house. But, but we moved in. The, the guy there had worked all these crazy hours, etc., to buy the house. His marriage had collapsed and he didn't have the marriage or the house. He had to sell it. So you think, no, oh, no. So I'm not saying I feel guilty about working long hours, but you've got to look at the relational cost and you may, it may be necessary to make changes in life. That's good. But you should, yeah. Yeah, thanks for asking these questions, boys. I feel like these are straight out of uh, my phone onto that screen. I really appreciate you. Um, sharing your answers and your time. And um, I've, I've asked Al to stay up because he's going to pray for us in just a second. But um, uh, again, in a moment, we're actually going to put some names up. Uh, we did do a, a draw. And so four of you are going to walk away with vouchers for Al's book, The Manual. Um, but just before you go, I guess this would be my, my last question. Uh, in, in the write-up for, um, for Al's book, um, this is what it says. Al makes no bones about his belief in Jesus and the central role his faith has in making him a better man and urges other men to hear the good news of who Jesus is and the difference he makes in all walks of life. And so I'll, I'll ask you this question earlier, and I'll ask you in front of the guys. Um, what's one way that Jesus has made a difference in your life as a man? Um, before I was a Christian, I had a simple goal in life, and that was to make as much money as I could. Because I thought if I made a stack of money, I wouldn't have the heartache and regrets that my father had. Uh, and so becoming a Christian really, how's it impacted my life? Jesus pushes me. I'm still learning. I've only been doing this for 42 years. Jesus pushes me to get my head up and to not be selfish and to live for something bigger than just myself and someone bigger than just myself. And so it's, that's, that's what I find him constantly uh, calling me to kind of heads up, live for something bigger than just being selfish. Um, and I'm still, I'm still working on it. Amen. Well, thank you, Al.